and this church he uses to make known his manifold wisdom. All right? And all the suffering he's endured, everything that he's going through, gone through in bringing the gospel to the Ephesians has not been in vain. And they did not worry about this because it's all part of God's plan. And then after this, Paul finally prays. And this is, this is Paul's uh, second prayer. And this almost brings us right to the end of the first half of Ephesians, right? And this is a, it's a very, very weighty prayer, uh, both in terms of what Paul is petitioning and also in just trying to understand it, right? So the Apostle Peter once said regarding Paul's writing, and I quote, there are some things in them that are hard to understand, yeah. right? So yeah. Peter says this about Paul. I'm saying to Peter, well, Peter, have you heard Paul pray, right? It's not any different. And so with that, let's read Paul's prayer and immerse ourselves in it. And so our reading for this morning as we continue our journey through uh, the book of Ephesians um, is taken from Ephesians 3, and we are reading from verse 14 uh, to 21. It's going to be up on the screen, but you're more than welcome to use your devices, open your Bibles. And so let's read God's word. For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. I pray that he may grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power in your inner being through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length, width, height, and depth of God's love, and to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that, is, uh, that works in us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, um, a weighty text, a weighty prayer. Um, but we deal with a weighty God. Uh, this is not a God that is far. This is a God that is near. Uh, this is a God who's revealed himself. And even as we go through the text here, Lord, uh, we see your abundant grace, your abundant love, um, how you relate to us, Lord. And so in going through Paul's words here, Lord, as KG uh, prayed for me earlier, Lord, uh, it may not be my words, but... May you transcend whatever I have here, Lord. I pray that uh, the voice that is echoed, the voice that is heard here is from you, Lord. Holy Spirit, um, be in our hearts. Uh, give us understanding. Give us eyes to see. Uh, bind up the broken. Bind up those who uh, walked in this morning looking for hope. And so, Lord, when we go through this text, we see that uh, there's an abundant, an abundance of love, Lord. There's an abundance of generosity, and I pray that um, in unpacking this as we go through it, Lord, uh, this is felt by everyone, Lord. And so I pray that in everything that we have done, we are doing right now, from from the band, from production, from everything that is happening in the background, Lord, may it fade away, Lord. It fade away in light of your glory, in light of your goodness, in light of who you are, Lord. May you be elevated. And so, Lord, we lay our hearts before you. We are crying. We need to hear from you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, quick rough overview before we enter the text, right? What's going to happen is we're going to see that Paul gives us three, three petitions. And those three petitions, we're going to very, very simply put them um, under two big banners, right? And this is actually four petitions. Uh, it's the what of Paul's prayer and the why of Paul's prayer. And this is all, all in verses 16 to 19. Now, before we go into Paul's petitions, uh, Paul starts out this prayer in verse 14 uh, by saying, for this reason, I kneel before the Father, 
from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. And so, as with every, any good scholar, we have to ask, what is the reason? And to get Paul's reason, uh, we have to go to the last part of chapter 2, right? And so what we know is that based, based on what Pastor Jonah preached on, uh, Paul, was, Paul was about to pray, he was saying, for this reason. This is the beginning of chapter 3. And then Paul just goes into this holy rant, right? He goes into this holy rant about the mystery of God. Uh, but before that, what, Paul, what Paul was doing was unpacking very beautifully and very richly the union of Jewish and Gentile believers in Christ and how Christ has brought down the dividing wall of hostility. And after this, he ends it very, very appropriately on verse 22, where he says this very, very powerful, comforting uh, verse, which is that uh, God is building you up to be his dwelling place through the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Contextually, for us, this is probably uh, a moment. You know, kind of felt it through the room. I said that it was very powerful. And it was like one amen there, you know. It was very silent. But... This, this is quite massive, uh, and we need to read this in context, you know? I imagine some of you have been here long enough, and like, man, it's context again. Guys, come on. You know, Rooted is not about three things. Rooted is about four things. It's gospel-centered, disciple-making, transcultural, and you will read it in context, right? But it is important. It's important because what we see here, we get to understand the audience, the people that Paul is saying this to you, to, and the weight that it carries. So we remember the audience, and many of them were Gentiles. So they've made a good living in the city of Ephesus, right? So it's a very rich city. Uh, the culture in there, the culture of the city, religion and politics were all just one cocktail, right? And so when we look at this, I'm sure when Paul drops this lofty truth, a lot of it was a shock to their system. I imagine some of them were still trying to grapple with their past pagan beliefs. And I imagine some of the Jews were looking at these Gentile believers with like very suspicious eyes. You know? And so while all, is, all of this is happening on the background, Paul just drops this heavy weight. He says, you are his workmanship. Uh, you are fellow citizens with the saints and of God's household. You have a new identity in Christ. Uh, basically, your status has changed and you are co-heirs with the Jews and with Christ. The idea of second class religious citizens does not exist anymore. And in all honesty, some of these truths, they, they sound great. I'm willing to accept these truths immediately. Uh, but Paul doesn't want these lofty, lofty truths just to tickle them. He doesn't want them to just tickle them intellectually, uh, but for them to live them out. And so if the first half of the letter to the Ephesians was about um, this, is, this is the doctrine, this is who you are, uh, this is Paul giving them enlightenment, right? Then this prayer is about the empowerment. Because enlightenment without empowerment is dangerous. Let me say that again. Enlightenment without empowerment is dangerous. Because here's, thi here's the thing, when we, when we just go on enlightenment, right, all that we have to go on is competency. And anyone who doesn't measure up, who walks in, anyone who doesn't measure up to our competency isn't welcomed in. And this was the, this was the issue with the religious, the religious rulers, the religious elite that Jesus would battle on a daily basis. So that you guys have been enlightened. You, you guys can grasp these truths. You guys know the law. You know the scriptures. Yeah yet you guys do not love. And once enlightenment becomes central, what, once it becomes an idol, we find like-minded people, uh, we form a tribe, uh, we start rebuilding uh, that dividing wall of hostility. 
right? I, I did that at one point in time, right? I did that at one point in time. Uh, new to Christianity, uh, discovering new doctrines, uh, these new things that not a lot of other people know, right? I started to use these things to almost uh, judge people, you know? Like, bro, do you not know what tulip is? Like, come on. Huh? It's like the other people that are like, what's tulip? Is that, is that, a, fl- is that a flower? Right? I'm not judging you. <laughs> I'm not judging you, but you know, you know, do you know Tulip? Huh? How far have you gone into reform theology? And what we start doing is rebuilding those walls. Right. Anyone that does not uh, look at the doctrine at the Bible the same way, uh, we say that they're not good enough, or they're looking at things the wrong way. They become second-class citizens, right? And we start to elevate the scriptures more than we should, instead of elevating the Christ behind the scriptures. Yeah. And then lastly, before going into Paul's petitions, it reminds us God is the father of all believers. Those who have passed on, those who still live, and those who would believe in him. And this is verse 15 where he says, from whom every family in heaven and earth is named. And well, one, well, one could easily say, but Kenny, it says everyone here, Right? The translation says every family, but the context says uh, specific people. The context is believers. And while God is creator of all, God is not the father of all. And that is a fact. Because if God was the father of all, this world would look significantly different. If God was the father of all, we would not have the majority of resources, wealth on one side of the continent. We would not have majority of the wealth in 10%, even less of the world, right? And so God is not father for all. And so as we shift gears, uh, we move into the what of Paul's prayer. What is Paul praying for? Paul has three petitions, um, each with its own condition. Uh, to list them, he says, uh, I want you to be strengthened with power in your inner being according to the riches of his glory. And this is verse 16. Um, the second one is that Christ may dwell in your hearts through f- faith. And this is verse 17. And the third one is uh, comprehend the love of God and know Christ's love. And the condition is being rooted and firmly established in love. And this is 17 and 18. And one thing that I love is that as we go through the text, we see that uh, there are patterns that emerge. And one of the patterns that emerges from here is that in praying for the Ephesians, Ephesian family of believers, Paul directs his prayer to the Trinity, the Godhead, the united eternal family, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this is a reminder of their distinctness, distinctness, but also their oneness, perfectly united in diversity. Because what's happening up there should be happening here. Yeah. It should be happening here. We should be perfectly united in our diversity. And the other pattern um, is that every request has a condition attached to it. And I know what we think about conditions. It's not, it's not the best of thoughts that come to mind when you think about conditions, right? A lot of the times, conditions are for the other party and not for us. Huh? At times, when we think about conditions, um, we think about conditions are limiting my freedom. We've kind of gone through this in the last couple of years, right? You can't enter this place without a mask, or without sanitizing. You can't travel to this place without uh, a vaccination card. Well, this is not a political statement, but the whole narrative around that has been a sense of, I feel like my freedoms are being taken away. And so I get the negative feelings towards conditions. And so unfortunately, we do bring some of those sentiments into church as well, right? See, some of you guys are nodding, right? So someone says, so someone comes and says, "Hey, I would like to plug into Rooted, right? 
well, want to be part of this. So they like, great. So while you plug in, you're, you're going to submit yourself, yourself to the shepherding of the elders. Yeah. Meaning that there will be people that will ask you questions about your faithfulness and obedience, right? They will ask you questions and go into places that no one else dares go to, right? And so sometimes um, the response is, nah, nah, nah dog. Uh, I, I just want to plug in and you can keep the shepherding, right? So this is my spiritual buffet. I will pick that and that and that, but you can keep your shepherding, right? And part of it is how we view conditions. And I'm convinced that uh, these conditions are there for our flourishing protection and real freedom. And as we go through Paul's conditions, we can see that they are there to make sure that the church thrives, that she immerses herself in God's immeasurable grace and love. And so let's have this in mind as we go through the next uh, verses. And so Paul's first petition says that, I pray that he may grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power in your inner being through his spirit. The first, of, the first of the things Paul prays for is power in the inner being. And so Paul asked the Ephesians, Paul asked that Ephesians may be strengthened with power in the inner being or the inner person, if you will. So the Greeks would say that the inner person is the engine, right? It's what drives you, it's what drives our will, our desires, our pursuits. You get the idea. This is the spiritual man. This is where everything is formed before it is unveiled to the world. Meaning that the whole idea of it just happened should be rebranded to it just revealed itself now. Right? And so Paul focuses on that inner person. In Corinth, in um, First or Second Corinthians four sixteen should be either one. Uh, Paul says it's going to be up there. Paul says, therefore, we do not give up, uh, even though our outer person is being destroyed, our inner person is being renewed day by day. So when the inner person is strengthened with power from the Spirit, then our thought life, our dreams, our visions, are directed by the Spirit. And most importantly, we are able to perceive God's will for our lives and for the church. We are able to say, not by my strength or power, uh, but by his strengthening power. Right? And so verse 16 also gives us the first of Paul's conditions. It says, strengthen them in accordance with the riches of your glory. Man, what Paul is asking for is remarkable, and I fear that we may gloss over this very quickly. But what Paul is saying is give them power in line with, in proportion with the riches of your glory. So here's a, here's a, a real-time example. A couple of years ago, um, for about two to three years, uh, my family, we struggled with the job market. Unemployment was on and off. Are very unstable and so a lot of the community came through and supported us in generous ways in unimaginable ways it was really remarkable um, and so there'd be there'd be many different people who give in a certain way right there'll be the kind of people who come and say hey what are your groceries right what what is the what is Rehema's school fees we're going to give something towards that, right? Which was remarkable. And by no means, this, what I'm telling you here, isn't to say either one is better. And then there'll be some who come and they say, hey, um, I'm going to give you something, right? And that something uh, is, was usually in proportion to their salary, their wealth, right? Whatever they had. And at times, it would be more than what we actually needed. So if what we needed was maybe just school fees, it would cover them five times. It would cover that five times over, right? And so here's a, another example. I feel like that one didn't land. <laughs> <laughs> so so this is this is this is easy, very quick. Patrice Mutsipe is worth three point two 
billion dollars, not rands, dollars, right? If Patrice Mutsipe was to write a check to Rooted for 20 million rand, <laughs> we w- <laughs> you have little faith. <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying I'm trying to give a point here. So if Patrice Munzipa was to give twenty million, right, rand, right, that is a lot. It is a lot. But if Patrice thank you, brother. <laughs> Patrice Munzipa was to give in accordance with his wealth, right? We are looking at Patrice Munzipa giving us one billion dollars. Right? Right? And so this is, this is what Paul is doing, right? Any power, any kind of power from God would be amazing. Any kind of power would be amazing. But Paul is saying, I don't want any kind of power. I want power in line of, in proportion with the riches of your glory. Right? And so he knows God to be an abundant and generous God. And so he asks for this from him. Guys, I'm convinced that sometimes the reason why we see no growth in how we are fighting sin, in our generosity, in our faithfulness, is because we pray to God in accordance with what we think he is and his character instead of who he actually is. Right? We pray like the world. We pray like orphans, right? And God is our Father, and God wants to give us more than we could ever imagine. So let's pray. Let's pray like children who have a father who is who isn't only infinitely rich beyond comprehension, but wants us to boldly approach Him with bold requests, right? Now, as we move to Paul's second petition in verse seventeen. Paul asked of the Father that Christ might dwell in their hearts. And so just a quick one here. The whole idea of Christ dwelling in their hearts. One might ask, but aren't the folks in the church um, in Ephesus believers? He's writing this letter to believers. Because at face value, it sounds like Paul, it sounds like something one would pray for people that are not saved, people that don't know the Lord. And so Paul, why ask this? You're just covering your bases in case uh, within that church, within that family, uh, there are people that maybe don't know the Lord. The people that just came in haven't accepted Christ, but they just keep coming back. They just keep coming back because there's just something about this community. And the answer to that is no. I believe the key word here is dwell. The word dwell uh, here is it's a Greek word, uh, which is katokeo, which means to dwell in, to settle in, to be established in permanently, to inhabit. And what this is communicating is a sense of permanence. And I would argue amongst other ideas that Paul is praying for their perseverance and continued transformation and not their salvation. And so the longer he dwells in my house, the longer he starts to transform my house the better my foundation and steadfastness. And so Paul sums this up well in Galatians 2.20, one of my favorite uh, memory verses where he says, uh, I've been crucified with Christ and no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so as we go into the second condition is that Christ might dwell in your heart's through faith. And so the same faith that saved you, it's not going to go up here. This was Ephesians 2 verse 8, Pastor Honor preached on this. It reads, for you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not for yourselves. This, it's a gift from God. So the same faith uh, is the same one that keeps going. The same faith that saved us keeps us going. We didn't at a point in time have faith and be saved and then faith goes out the window. And so as we continue to trust in the Lord who dwells within, we continue to be transformed, shaped and molded into his likeness. Yeah. And so the writer of Proverbs in Proverbs 3 verse 5 
verse 5 to 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own understanding. In all your ways know him and will make your path straight. So rooted, are we trusting in Jesus not just for our salvation, but our continued existence on this earth? In my early days as a Christian, we went, we went very crazy, very, very zealous young guys. We were crazy about the gospel, and all we talk about is, man, would you die for the gospel? Would you die for the gospel? God, give us strength and power to die for the gospel, uh, when really we still had a long life ahead of us. And the, the truth of the matter is, we should have been praying, God, um, help me to live for the gospel, right? Help me to live for the gospel. And so, have we started with Jesus and continued with our own plans? Like in a way, we said, Jesus, you can, you, can come into, you can come into my house, but I want you to stay by the couch there, right? So those other three rooms, stay away. Uh, you can just stay in the couch. I just kind of want to have everything remain the same, but you're kind of here as well. Do we still have old pictures of our old lives? Or have we stored them in a secret place? Are we still idolizing our previous lives? Are we still swayed by the things of the world? Are we seeing new convictions and new thought patterns in our lives? And we see later that the result of Christ dwelling in us through faith in us is that we will be rooted and grounded in love. And as we swiftly move on, we get to the last of Paul's petitions. Uh, this petition serves to give us the purpose of the previous two. And it reads as follows. I pray that, um, I pray that you being rooted, uh, quick one, other translations link this to the previous verse. So they kind of come in and they say that, so that being rooted, right? And so pray that, so that being rooted and firmly established in love, you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and width, height, and depth of God's love. And to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge. And so if I was to summarize this, I would say, through the strengthening of the, of the inner, inner, inner man by means of the Spirit, through the indwelling of Christ in their hearts, the readers are to become established in love, and having been established in love, are able to comprehend the greatness of the love of Christ. Now, with verse 18, a lot of people have tried to unpack what, what Paul means about you know, the, the height, depth, uh, length, uh, width, you know, um, a lot of it very, very interesting. I, I, I encourage you, go Google the four dimension uh, of God's love. Um, some of them are just widely absurd, right? They're just all over the place, but very, very interesting reads. Uh, people have got lots of ideas on what it is. But in all honesty, um, all of this have, have as their basis assumptions. And so for me, to simplify it, the takeaway from this is that God's love is both immense and immeasurable. And not only that, but it also surpasses knowledge. And that is great news, and we'll see shortly why. And so the root Greek word translated as comprehend here has been defined as to lay hold of, to seize. And if you think about the Latin, the Latin saying, carpe diem, it translates to seize the day. Right? It's strong language. It speaks of in intensity. Right? You don't use seize to say, can you go seize some ketchup in the fridge, <laughs> right? So this isn't just me understanding that Paul is talking about. Um, this is to make it your own. And so hence, for, Paul follows it up with verse 19 where he says, to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge. Uh, this word know has many uses in the Bible, uh, and one of them is to denote, denote closeness or relationship. And so what we'll see a lot of the times, it will, the Bible will say that uh, this husband uh, knew his wife and then they conceived. 
And so this speaks of a closeness, a close intimacy. And so this length, width, height, depth of God's love, this mystery, it isn't for us to intellectually grasp. And even, there, even then it's unknowable, but it's for us to experience closely, right? It's experiential. And if I was to summarize this pure, poorly, I would say that may we lay hold of, seize, experience the immeasurable and limitless love of God. This is that, this is that um, as far as the east is from the west is removed our transgressions type of love. Right? This is the uh, new mercies every morning type of love. This is that uh, for God so loved the world type of love. This is that um, you have not been abandoned. I'm coming back type of love. Right. And while all of this sounds great, it is scary because some of us are in the red zone. Some of us are wondering, does God really love me? You know, nothing seems to be coming together. You feel rejected and abandoned. And I'm confident when I read verse 18, which says that, you may be able to comprehend with all the saints, read here with other people, with the community of believers. And so your strengthening, your indwelling by Christ to comprehend the love of God, it isn't a solo project, guys. It's not a solo project. You are not meant to do this alone. No one is. By including the saints there, it's a reminder to us that this letter was written to a group of people, not an individual. And I know that it gets lost in our culture. We, li- we live in such an individual society that it makes it remarkably easy to, to read the text and insert myself into it. You know, what does the text mean for me? What, is, what does God want for me? When really what we should be reading is, what does this mean for us? What does it mean for us as a community, as a people? And so we run the risk of missing out on God's grand plan for the world and we also miss out on being witnesses to God transforming communities. Because we're overly preoccupied with what God can do for me. Guys, I'm not answering a call. I lost a page. (laughs) Cut that out, please. (laughs) So as we, con- as we continue, it's a community effort. I'd even go as far as to say that given the context of Ephesus, it's a trans- transcultural community effort, all right? You are meant to have people around you, praying with you, and if you're unable to pray, praying for you, and people that you're praying for. So my encouragement is step in, plug in, start serving, man. Start hearing stories from other people about how God is working in their lives, his love towards them. And as you get deeper and deeper with the rest of the saints, we start to grow as a collective. We start to grow in comprehending the width, the length, and the depth of God's love. So now we move to the why part of Paul's prayer. This is now the climax of Paul's prayer. Uh, This is what we all came for, right? This is what Paul has been building up to. Uh, This is the chief end of the strengthening of our inner being by the Holy Spirit, the glorious consequence of Christ dwelling in us, of comprehension and knowing of God's love. This is the why to Paul's prayer. It's for us to be filled with the fullness of God. Amen. And it's in principle to be like God. This is rather tricky for several reasons, right? Does Paul mean the fullness of God happens now or does it happen when we are in glory? Because if it is now, it is super awkward, right? It is super awkward. I mean, I ask you guys, how many of you uh, are in a state of the fullness of God? (laughs) So what's wrong with us? 
And so maybe it's, maybe it's later, maybe it's in glory, but Paul's language, his prayer, seems to be pointing to now. And so in 2 Corinthians 3.18, Paul says the following, uh, we all with unveiled faces are looking, in a, are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. Uh, this is from the Lord who is the Spirit. Mm-hmm. What is here is that our becoming more like God isn't an event but an ongoing process which starts now and will never end because God is infinite. And so being filled with the fullness of God means that we image him in how we love, how we serve, how we give, how we forgive, how we ask for forgiveness and the list is endless. Now, to uh, to close us off, We go to verse 20 and 21. And so Paul uh, appropriately ends this with a doxology. And so a doxology is an expression uh, of praise to God. And so Paul uses this doxology to recenter us in the fact that all of this is meant to point to God in his power and manifold wisdom. Yeah. That the goodness of his work in the church does not terminate on a bunch of individuals or groups of people, but it terminates with his honor and praise. No one can say, man, I grew this church. I made this church. This is my church. That even when we punt this whole idea that we are transcultural, it isn't a gimmick to try and be different, guys. (laughs) That we are pointing to a multifaceted God who is to be fully known through a diverse and complex people. Guys, how remarkable is it that in the vastness of God's creation, like uh, we are talking about black holes, giant stars, uh, things about this world that we're yet to discover. God chooses us, the church, to display his manifold wisdom to the heavenly beings and for his glory. How remarkable is that? So let's live in light of that. Let's live in light of the fact that, man, what what God has poured into, into the body, into the church is remarkable. That it's going to outlast everything. That we look at the church, what the church has gone through, the persecution that she's gone through, how the church has been used badly and yet it still thrives. It still thrives, and it only thrives because God is rich in mercy and he continues to move through us. Let us pray. Lord, um, man, we, we are going to, we are going to think, ponder about these things for the rest of our lives into eternity. I pray that we may not grow weary um, of this journey. I pray that each and every day, Lord, um, may we be amazed. May we, may we see uh, just the this tremendous God of ours, who He is, made just grow a light within us that no one can snuff out, Lord. I pray that this may be infectious everywhere we go, Lord. That when people see this, they see You. We we'll be the kind of Christians that when we walk out there, Lord, people see your power manifested, your power in love, your power in kindness, in generosity, in faithfulness, in obedience, in how we love, how we serve other people. Lord, empower us. Give us strength. And pray that we manage to do this in community, Lord. That for those that are on the outside, those are, that are still thinking about this, that are still pondering about, uh, am I going to be accepted? There's room for many more. Not at this rooted table, Lord, but at your table. So, Lord, we love you. We need you. We honor you. We glorify you. And many more words. And so, Lord, we pray all of this in your holy name. Amen.